Okay. Um, I'm Kelly Tatum. Uh, I have a small Stafford program, uh, Breaking Bad Staffords. Um, I'd say my journey has been a bit of a roller coaster, um, a lot of good and a lot of uh, navigating um, kind of through some challenges. Uh, it's been great, though. Um, <laughs> so I've always I always wanted to show from the time show and breed from the time I was a very young child. My original goal was American Staffordshire Terriers. Um, I just had always loved them. I knew about Staffordshire Bull Terriers, um, but they just, it really wasn't a thing on my mind because one, they just, especially, they're not high numbers. They're not here in high numbers at all now, much less 10 years ago when I was looking, you know, kind of like, looking into um this whole thing um but when i finally did have a chance uh to get my because i was raised where dogs were not i did not have access to well-bred dogs i did not know anyone in any time not even sports venues um not showing um i just i lived where dogs were property and that's how people thought about it uh, so when I finally got to a point where I could get my first well-bred dog, um, I was looking into the breeds again, even though I knew Amstaffs were what I wanted. Um, and then there was just something about the Staffordshire Bull Terrier that just really drew me in, just because they're just they're just they just seemed so. Um, it's like almost the same, you know, almost the same, but just a smaller version, and it, it was intriguing to me. Um, but trying to find a breeder, I'm sorry, I have a litter of puppies that are eight weeks old. And if you can hear them, I apologize. Yeah, no worries. It, it's a dog park, dog podcast, so that's that's uh, it's the way it should be. They're eight weeks old, and the they're man, velociraptors right now. Okay, that's fine with me. No worries. Okay. Um, but, yeah, so trying to find a breeder um, without knowing breeders is very difficult. And I had even gone to shows before. Um, I, I do – I can get pretty shy, and it's hard for me to approach people. But um, the show world does tend to be um, – they cannot be – as welcoming to new people as uh, you would think. Um, I went to a Amstaff National where I was completely snubbed, and I don't. Maybe it wasn't on purpose, at all, but I, I didn't have a good experience. So, <laughs> they just you just get nervous after that. Um, but it, of course, now that we had the internet at our fingertips, it was a lot of research and just looking into different breeders. I did talk to a few. Um, in the U.S., and it seemed like they had a very, it was just very overwhelming when you, when, when I tell them, I want to show, this is my, my childhood dream, um, and, you know, I intend to follow through with everything that I say I'm going to do, um, and it, it, it was a bit of a struggle for me, um, so, and another thing about Staffordshire Bull Terriers is we have a very limited amount of breeders here, but overseas, they're they're just they're they're everywhere. They're I mean if you if you watch Crufts or Westminster, the difference in entry for the Staffordshire Bull Terrier is crazy. Westminster might have ten Staffordshire Bull Terriers, but Crufts you have three hundred to four hundred entries of Staffordshire Bull Terriers. Um, so honestly, it's, it's, you have a lot more options that way. Um, so I came across a breeder on Facebook and, uh, days of Stafford, his name is, uh, Rafa Salado. And he had a, uh, I had watched him for a short time and he had a puppy that I was so drawn to. Um, because, one, because he looked like one of my dogs that had passed away, and that's possibly silly, but it just, it, 
it was just one of those things that it could like spoke to my heart. <laughs> um yeah, and I saw I reached out to him and um kind of told him what I was looking for and again I'm a total newbie total newbie to it still hadn't learned pedigrees hadn't learned much but I you know I'm I'm in it um so I I do it I import I do import import him I got him in 2018 in my first um but even then I was still uh I still struggle with like trying to get into the show world because again not knowing anybody and at that time um like I didn't know that there were handling classes so I had him for two years before I actually went to my first handling class um so um and once I did that it kind of like took off like I went to a class um, the teacher, the handler there was very, was very helpful. And before I knew it, I was taking off to Alabama for my first show. I'm in Texas. So taking off to Alabama for my first show. And it was, it was great. I, I didn't, I won a couple of ribbons, didn't get any points, but honestly, I was just super happy for the experience. Um, I got a bunch of help from the people there this time. They, it was very great. I, I, I came back just so ecstatic because people were just very, very welcoming to me at that point. Um, and then it all, from there, from then on out, we I kind of took off. I didn't do any sports at that point. I was kind of focusing on confirmation because that was my that is that was my main goal um, is to one get into the world, um, learn, and kind of like try to work work on a program building my own program um but it it just takes a long while to like learn pedigrees um you know learn how how to i guess learn how to show and then how to get to a point where you 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 breed um but not just breed breed to improve on the breed um but yeah, so it took me about four months to, to finish him. I, I'm, it, I was actually pretty quick. We're very, very lucky that in Stafford's, we can own or handle them. Um, I know that there are many breeds that cannot be. Uh, I know AKC is so very competitive, um, very difficult, very rigid. But luckily, this is a breed that you can own, and you can take them and show them, and you can finish them yourself. I, I my first show was in November, and I got his champion. I finished his championship in March, so it took me like four or so months to to finish his championship. Um, Talk about how difficult, um, you know, just probably being you know, not a type of person that would likes the limelight, like, like myself, but how, what were some of the things that just drove you to, to be able to do that? Like drive from Texas to Alabama, that to me takes a lot of gumption and, and, and like motivation For to me, do that. Oh my goodness. For me, it was one probably, and I know it's to some, they're probably not. But for me, it was probably one of the craziest things I've done next to importing a dog, which I had never done that before either. Um, but just, it was just kind of one of those, like, because I'm not naturally, I'm not a natural extrovert. Um, but I want, this is something that, I, like I said, I wanted to do. The motivation had always been there. So it was kind of like I had, I was like, I'm doing this. I, if I had to push myself, um, to do it, then I, I will. So I kind of went, it was kind of like one of those, like, I'm going all out. Um, I'm just, um, this show, because numbers aren't very big, um, I was able to find a, a Facebook page where it, it's, it's called where that, where are the majors? And so I was able to find out where a lot of the other Stafford people were going. Um, cause, uh, most shows, there's not a big, big numbers. It's just like anywhere from, three to 10 Staffords um, is kind of average. 
Uh, but this show in particular, I think, had like 20, 20 or 25, something like that. Um, and a lot of well-known breeders are there. So I thought this would be the uh, perfect chance, um, perfect opportunity. And there had been people that said that they would help me, um, kind of help me, guide me to where I need to go. Um, cause again, I've never been in that show environment and AKC being super, super rigid. It, it was kind of, it was definitely nerve wracking for sure. But I was just, I was just at the point where I'm going to force myself to do it. I, I even had, my, I was like, I'm going to greet everybody there. Like all the, with all the breeders there, I wanted to personally come up and, and meet them and, you know, just try to make connection with them um, and try to find a mentor, honestly. Um, it, I don't want to say that I have a mentor. I, I, like, I, for a while, I, I had one, and then she, as soon as like, she was okay to mentor me, she got out of the breed. So that made it kind of difficult. Um, I, I did end up meeting someone at that show who did become, she kind of, still is my mentor she's more of a moral support she's she's there to kind of like cheer me on um but just um when I got up there people people did help me out and it was a great experience I learned a lot I learned a lot <laughs> um I even I got to we I got to go out to eat I was invited to go out to eat with people and mainly I just sat back and listened and by doing that, I think just by watching and listening, you learn so much, um, especially, when, especially when you don't know anything. Um, but I got a lot of tips and a lot of just a lot of help. Um, my import, he, he did well, um, but I do feel like his type is not really what the judges in like to really see here and this is all stuff that I learned later um he did finish quickly um but he just he wouldn't be a um a male that I can take to you know high-end shows Montgomery or Westminster you know but he is a, a he was a good dog to start with he was a great dog to start with um and just to have fun doing which is kind of really the goal at that point I like I knew that I wanted a program, but it's kind of you baby steps first, learning the ropes first, because um, at that point, I in my mind, it's I can't I cannot breed a dog unless I prove that it's breed worthy. Um, not only showing confirmation, but temperament. You know, I do I did want to get into sports as well. Um, but confirmation was still my my primary goal. Uh, talk about your first experiences looking for that show quality, breed quality establisher, and what led you um, to just to, to decide that maybe that uh, importing was the way to go. I know you kind of touched upon it, but just to elaborate a little more, maybe. So. Um... Again, being naive, not really knowing how to go about with the process. Um, for me, at that time, I just I wanted to make sure that one they they were legit because when you look overseas, it, there's a little bit of you know there's a little bit of fear that you you know you can get scammed or you're going to get the worst of the worst. I, that that's very common to hear is that people that in importing you're at risk of getting basically the worst of the litter um but um i came i've joined a bunch of group a bunch of groups and like i said most of our breeders are overseas um so there's a lot you know so i follow a lot of them and then just coming across that breeder um and you can you can see clearly in his you know what his accomplishments what he's done with his dogs um and to finish to finish a championship on a dog in Spain is very difficult. Um, it, it is a feat to do. It's it is easier to finish a dog here than it is in Spain. Um, they have to beat 
a lot more dogs than we have to here. Um, there are certain shows like here we 15 we need 15 points and two of those points two of those you have to have two majors which basically means you have to beat a certain amount of dogs um and for texas i think you need to beat like five dogs for a major but over there you have to be like a (laughs) hundred that's just kind of like an example it varies across different countries Anyway, so the fact that he had um, ch- he had ch- finished champion dog showed me that that dog has been under quite a few judges and obviously has enough virtues to to champion. Um, and I'm not even going to go into the politics because that's that's just a whole nother story. Um, some people feel that this, you know, sometimes the dogs aren't awarded based on virtue. But to me, going out and showing the dog under the judge does speak volumes for, you know, uh, how well the dog does in the ring. Um, and that, that's what I was going off of when I was looking to get a, a puppy to show. And, of course, I, you know, I, I talked to the breeder saying what I wanted. And the pictures I saw of him, he was, he was stacked up. So you could see um, he showed me his bite. You know, he sent me videos. Um, You know, I did get to see his structure. Um, So that that helped. Um, But yeah, that's kind of what why I ended up deciding to go. And one thing about buying one thing I didn't know was kind of a kind of an advantage. No, it's an advantage is that like you. Getting from a breeder here um, often comes with a lot of restrictions, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing because I do the same thing with my own dogs. I really, with my own puppies that I send out, I I do have restrictions, Um, but there is a sense of um, relief getting a dog that is yours, and and for me, I trust myself. I trust myself with a dog that I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to become like a backyard breeder and just like, just, I'm not. I I know that I'm going to go through with what what I said I was going to do. I was going to show the dog. I was going to do the health testing, um, do some sports. Um, he he is at this time my most titled dog. In he's grand champion. Um, he has a fast cat title. Um, we've been kind of dabbling in barn hunt um he's done coursing he's got a title in that um trick dog just different things um but uh there's just a, a a freedom that you have when you own the dog outright um since then i've gotten several dogs from breeders over uh breeders here and i feel like having that first dog importing that first dog and showing other breeders that I look, I am going to shows. I am, I am trying to do, I trying to better the breed, trying to do the best I can. Um, you know, if my own program, I think it's 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 good to show them that you are serious about your commitment to the breed. Because this community is here is very small and very, very protective, very protective of their breed. Um, you won't really see any Staffordshire Bull Terriers in any shelters here or rescues because our breed club is very quick to get them out. Um, and they want to keep it that way. And I, and I totally get that. I totally understand that. So... They are very protective about who they want to give breeding rights to, um, and I'm kind of I'm the same with my own puppies. I don't give out breeding rights um, to anybody um, unless they kind of want to get into the show into showing. Um, but other than that, they're on spay and neuter contracts and the whole deal. <laughs> Many or many of our breeders do um, have. We do have a lot of breeders who import themselves as well. I think doing it as your first dog, it's probably like 
it's a risk. Um, it is a risk, uh, especially if you're not too familiar with pedigrees, which at the time I, I really wasn't. Um, I do think I got lucky. Um, but yeah, it is, it, it's a lot on this subject for sure. Um, and then we do have a lot who, who will import, who will bring in um, semen to, to breed. Um, that happens quite a bit, I guess, to bring in the, you know, genetic diversity and the fact that, like, like I said, there are so many overseas, so many nice, nice staffers overseas. And to bring that over here, I think is very helpful. Talk about the, the process. What, cause to me, it's, it, it's something that I would like to do someday. Um, uh, especially when you're dealing with breeds that, that I'm interested in, like mini bull terriers and Staffordshire bull terriers, because there just isn't the numbers uh, over here like there is overseas. Um, talk about the process. Just kind of give people insight what it was like and how you had to go through uh, each step and what a learning curve that was and, and just kind of the ins and outs of importing. Yeah, the, um, so I've imported, uh, well, three times now, um, two or one time, the first time, um, it, with my first, it was a lot easier, but it was also back in 2018, they didn't require a broker, um, like they do now, um, and honestly, the breeder did most of the work, he, he pretty much arranged everything, um, you know, I I paid, <clears throat> I I paid the airline directly, which for me, never having bought a dog, never having imported, and hearing horror stories about people, even the the bank was like, "Are you sure? Are you sure?" <laughs> um, but having I paid the airline directly, so that that did help. And then um, he basically kind of let me know what to do. Um, so that was a totally different experience than what it is now. Um, I just recently imported a bitch from Ukraine, uh, brought her in with her brother. Um, and again, the breeder kind of does most of the work, um, but you do have to, you have to have a broker now. So once you contact the broker, um, and I, I, I just posted on pages asking for recommendations and um and i found someone i think you can just google it and find someone as well but once you contact them they get all the information they need from you and then they and the breeder do most of the work um you have it, I, it is an extra cost to have a broker um quite a bit um but honestly, it, it's worth it because they, they do most of the work. Um, they kind of just arrange everything for you. So, and this time I didn't pay. I, I, I paid the, the breeder directly. And then I pay, paid the broker as, um, as soon as the, as soon, pretty much as soon as it was done, um, like established. <laughs> um, yeah. Basically, they do my, they do more of the work. Um, I've never sent a puppy off um, far uh, farther than Canada. So as far as that part of the progress, I have or that part of the yeah of the progress, I really don't know how it works. Um, but it's just you basically give give you pay whoever needs to be paid, and they tell you where to go and what to do and what information to give. It's I, it's actually pretty easy that way <laughs> um there's really no like filling out paperwork or you know signing on to this it's just it's it's simple it's the biggest thing that's why i like to get recommendations that that's uh, this is why i will never get rid of facebook because you th that's where i find my handling classes that's where i found my breeder that's where i found my mentor that's where i found my, my broker i feel like talking to people um they and who give you references they have dealt with them they have dealt with them so they know who to trust and i think yeah that is a big deal is 
well, I guess there's kind of two worries is um, importing dogs in the summer is it's, it's worrisome. Um, there's a danger of them overheating because they keep them in car. Uh, some some keep them in cargo. Um, some will get a nanny, which I think is the safest option when you're using or when you're coming from quite a distance and when you're doing it during the warmer months. Um, I think, in fact, I think there's restrictions now. I think there are certain months that they don't even that they don't fly puppies in. Um, but so that, that's a concern because they keep, like I said, they keep them in cargo. And then when you get there, you're pretty much waiting a really, really long time. Um, but, and then, the, and then, oh yeah. And then you have to pay a gate fee. So really there's a lot of fees involved, but I've actually found that with Stafford's, it, it costs me the exact same amount to import a Stafford than it does to buy one in the United States um, because Stafford's overseas tend to be cheaper because I, I'm assuming because they are such high numbers, there are plenty of breeders. Um, they're, they're just very, they're just not as expensive. Um, but then by the time you pay the, by the time you pay everything else, it ends up being the same. Have you ever thought about uh, being your own flight nanny? So Would that I save actually, any money? I do fly my own puppies. My pup, okay, most I give people options when I have puppies. I give people the option they can they can fly in if they want. I'll meet them at the airport, or if they want to fly in and come to me or meet, I will do that as well. Um, ground transport, I've offered that because I have someone that I know and I trust. Um, but most people uh like they like me to fly them i used the nanny one time and i just thought that um it was very expensive and you know stafford puppies aren't cheap um and i think i think my puppies are pretty much average or even on the lower side of average um but i i just it's a lot for people to pay for a puppy and then a nanny on top of that. So I do try to help out with that. And also I enjoy flying. So um, I fly my own puppies. You know, it's, I, I think I've done it maybe 15, 14, 15 times now. And it's, it's been, I think I've only had one or two hiccups, but pretty much it's a, it's gone smoothly for me. Would you ever uh, fly overseas to pick up a puppy for yourself or? Um, Colt, my first breeder, had actually talked to me about that, but uh, I might if I ever got comfortable enough doing it, but at this point, probably not. Um, I might look into it later, but I actually don't get many or any. I think I've gotten one inquiry from from overseas, and I just was not ready to, to, do, to even attempt that. Um, so no, um, but again, I don't think I'll be getting more as many inquiries because uh, there are just so many breeders overseas in all countries, um, to choose from. So, and I'm just a small time breeder in, in Houston, Texas, <laughs> who's just kind of navigating my way. I, I want to say the puppy's more comfortable, but Stafford puppies are, they just, I've never known a Stafford puppy to mourn its brothers or sisters, to mourn even me as the breeder. Stafford puppies are so just, they just go with it. They're just like, they go to their, they go to their new home and there is literally like no adjustment period. They're just, it was like they're, they've always been there. Every Stafford puppy that I have placed, that's what I hear. They're just like, they, they just, they act completely normal. They're not scared. They, they are not timid. They do not hide. They, they get in there and they are just on. They're on every time. And I think that's just a breed. I think that's just a breed trait. I don't think it has anything to do with how I raise them though. I do, you know, I do do a lot of, you know, I do ENS and puppy culture and all the things, you know, socializing. 
Um, but I just think it's a breed. I think it's a breed trait. I thought I knew what I was getting into. I, I mean, like, I, of course, there's a little bit of worry about importing and all that. But I thought because I had had, um, you know, before that, I didn't know the difference between good and bad breeders because, of course, I didn't know anybody. So I had ended up with kind of backyard bred pit bulls, Amstaff, whatever they were. So I dealt with bully breeds, you know. Um, I thought uh, I can do this because, I mean, they're, they're what? They're... They're essentially the same, you know, <laughs> that's what I thought. Um, but in reality, they definitely have their own nuances, uh, susceptible terriers. One, I find that they are, um, they have a lot more energy. Um, they are more high, they're just, I don't want to say high strung. They're just very active and just need a very active lifestyle. Um, and I think that surprises a lot of people. Um, and in addition to that, they are also very soft. They are very soft tempered. Um, they do not do well with a head. Like they, they do not do well in like being raised in a heavy, like any heavy handed training, um, any environment where there's, um, a lot of conflict or loud noises. Like I don't want to say loud noises, but negative negativity. Um, they're soft, um, so that was kind of a surprise to me. Like I never would have said that dogs before that. I'm like dogs are dogs. Dogs don't pout. Dogs don't hold grudges. And that no. Staffords pout and Staffords hold grudges. <laughs> they they are incredibly. They, they just, they, they read the room really, really well. If you're upset, they are, they feel it. They feel it. If you're mad, they feel it. Sometimes to the point where they will, like, they will leave the room. Like, they don't want, you know, they're, remove themselves from that. Um, I don't train, like, I do positive reinforcement with training. Um, but I have seen, you know, I have seen them being handled, like, say on, um, like a choke chain where when you correct them, it's mainly the noise, you know, you kind of jerk the, the, the leash. So the chain makes a noise that tightens up and releases. You don't do that to a Stafford. They, they will flatten out like a pancake. <laughs> um, so they're just overall soft. It's very, it's actually very well known in the community that they are, they are soft tempered. Um, they will break down at um, any type of heavy handed training. Um, they just fall apart. But they're so eager to like please. They they are so Velcro. Like they want they just they want to make you happy. Um, and I guess that's not really too different from any other bully breed to be honest. Um, but it's very extreme. Um, it's very extreme. This the the, the neediness is pretty extreme. But it's I think it's great because one they don't really run off like they're not they're not big wanderers they like to be with their family and i'm not saying that that goes for every there's nuances in every breed you know i'm sure there's labs out there that don't swim basically um but yeah they they'd like to be right there with their family um and even other bully breeds, I know like in Amstaffs and any other bully breeds where they talk about like when it comes to children, how they are, they have, you know, they love children. Well, this, it is like, it is a hundred times true with Staffords. Staffords and children, they, they just go, they go together like cookies and milk. Um, I can be at a show and I'll have my, I'll have my Staffords and, you know, people walk by all the time, especially adults. And my dogs are kind of like, yeah, okay. Um, but if a kid walks by, they, they will track them. They will track them tail wagging. Like, please, like, like they want, they want this kid. They want this kid to come say hi. Like they are desperate to be loved by this kid. Um, they just have such an affinity for children and it's just, it's innate. Um, and it's very, I've never seen it so pronounced before than I have since having Stafford's. Yeah. I do have one, I have an Amstaff. I have one Amstaff 
um, I kind of got her as a ode to my original goal of wanting an AM staff, and the differences is night and day, um, to be honest. I mean, there obviously there are certain similarities, but um, my AM staff is definitely more spicy, hard-headed. She doesn't she doesn't quite listen as well as the other ones, um, and her breeder tells me it's like completely normal um, for an AM staff. Um, and like I said, I had had bully breeds before but never well-bred ones so like, I kind of thought I knew what to expect um, I also find that Staffords don't have as much dog aggression um, that being said I would never say you know it's there you know it's there but I, and I would never you know not keep that in mind when having my Staffords out together especially the same sexes but um, it just, they don't seem as hot um, in, in my experience. And I've had um, up to nine here. So I, I feel like <laughs> I've, I've had a good um, enough experience to kind of get an idea of that. Um, and I've also heard other Stafford breeders say that as well with their dogs. Um, but I think those are the, you know, the, the main nuances that I can think of. My program will will it will still will mainly be Staffordshire Bull Terriers. Um, my M staff is a gorgeous bitch. Um, the breeder says one of the nicest that she's ever bred. She's essential. I'm just essentially going to do what she wants. I don't think I'm going to have my own program. If I do, it will be a very 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 small part because my my Stafford program has. It's kind of extensive. It has a couple different directions that I'm going into, um, that I'm going into. So it takes a lot um, of me. It takes a, it just takes a lot. That's all I focus on. But it's it's a lot for me. So my AMSAP program is just going to be tiny, if anything. But yes, yeah, she will get bred um, once she's done uh, showing and campaigning. Can you uh, talk about the the uh... The breeding process with um, Staffordshire Bull Terriers, there's any, anything that surprised you, anything that um, people should be aware of when they first start getting into the breed? Well, I think the most important thing about getting into the breed is just, um, well, I guess regarding breeding, um, not honestly, this was because I had never bred before. Um, I don't know if there's many nuances regarding breeding compared to other breeds. Um, I do know that they have a higher tendency to have difficulties in labor, even compared to M staffs. And M staffs are, are they tend to be free whelpers and have big litters. Staffords don't have big litters. I mean, they, it's like three to six is average. Um, but they, yeah, they. It can go wrong, <laughs> um, and I think that I think that's pretty normal for a lot of for a lot of other bully breeds. Probably, I'm assuming you know any breed that has the big shoulders, um, because I feel like if you look at it, if you look at a Staffordshire Bull Terrier like compared to an Amstaff, they are so much more front heavy um, in the shoulders, and naturally that kind of translate into having issues giving birth. I've I do have a girl that I have had to have a you know c-section on and um once she had that i was never going to let her free whelp after that because of that um but yeah just the higher rate of c-sections than most breeds they make great moms um i think i think i've heard that a lot of people think that they don't um but i think they might have got them confused with bull terriers i think someone released an article recently or they talked about how Staffords have a tendency to eat their puppies. That is, that's not correct. Um, I think that they were, I think that they had, were talking about bull terriers and may have got them mixed up, but you, the, our whole community was like kind of reeling after that. Like, no, that's, the, Staffords make great moms. Um, I'm not saying every, there, there are no issues with mothering instincts at times, but Staffords are fantastic mothers. They do a great job. They are very protective of their puppies. They're very, um, 
just very sacrificing moms. Um, uh, I, well, there is a nuance about them that I just thought, oh, yes, because they are really heavy, <laughs> Staffords are heavy, they're clumsy, they, they literally have no sense of self-preservation. They do have a tendency to um, not be very careful about how they lay down. I, I have a welt box with pig rails and everything, but but that first week to two weeks is is just I, I have to be there at all times because um, they tend to lay down and not feel their puppies. They're just so they're so heavy for being so small. Um, so. I know that that is a thing, um, so I, that's something to watch out for if, you know, someone wants to look into breeding Staffordshire Bull Terriers. So, so it, I went through years, I mean years, of trying to find my way, um, of trying to find a direction that was right for me. Um, not really having like one mentor um, kind of didn't help. Um, so what I did is I talked to a lot of breeders and to try to get like an idea of what how they run their program, what they thought was, um, what they thought about the standard, what they were breeding, and like got a lot of really really good insight. But as far as like, and, and a lot of them were just like, find your type, find your type. And you know, make sure it, it adheres to the standard, um, and then you know, go from there. Um, but I still struggled, um, and a lot. Some breeders like don't like to don't like to talk about the type difference, but there really is. So there's something to be said about our standard. Um, apparently, not all breeds not all breeds have or like breed standards have both weight and height requirements. Um, usually they'll have just one or the other. Um, so if you if you look at our standard um, four feet, so height is 14 to 16 inches, um, and then weight, like for females is 20, uh, what is it, 24 to 34. Um, males is uh, 20, uh, 28 to 38. Um, so that means what I was taught, that means a 14 inch female should be 24 pounds. A 14 inch male should be 28 pounds. Well, you're not gonna find that. You're not gonna find that in the ring. You just aren't. Um, a 16 inch male, a 16 inch, 38 pound male, you were not gonna find that being championed in the ring. Um, like my first, he's 16 and a half inches. Um, yeah, he's a half inch over. He is um, a little over 38 pounds. So technically he is the proportion they're supposed to be, but when he's in the ring, he tends to be a lot lighter substance wise than most that you see in the ring. So that has also been a huge, huge struggle of mine because what they're saying in the standard is not really what's being, it's not really what you see in the breed ring at all. Um, we see a lot of dogs with um, that are within the height range but they have a lot more bone and substance, so that naturally they're heavier. They they don't re they're they surpass the weight requirements. Um, and honestly, that and after years of of kind of trying to figure out where I want to go, that's the look that I like. That I do like um, a not a completely bully Stafford. I like, because um, they're supposed to be a nice blend of, of terrier, you know, bull and terrier, not really swinging one way or the other, but there's no clear definition, really. There's no, like, it's you, you kind of up to the breeder to where they want to go on that. And then, and then to make it more difficult is when you, ha when you go to breed, you, you might have 
throwback. I don't want to say throwbacks, but you might have some puppies that are like terrier, more terrier, and some that are that are more bulldog. And it's like, well, no, you want what you were aiming for was something right in the middle. Um, and I think a lot of that difficulty has a, it obviously has a lot to do with the, the fact that they are developed from two totally different types of dogs. I mean, you're, if you take a terrier and a bulldog who are completely different and you slap them together and you start breeding from that, it's going to take a long time to get to a point where we are breeding more consistently, um, the same type. Um, so I, I do like Staffords within the height range, but they tend to be a little heavier than what the standard calls for. Um, I just that's just kind of how it's how it's been. Um, it, our standard does say proportion is very important. Um, I think that that's more we put more em emphasis on proportion being more important than actually following the exact guidelines of of the height and weight because we have. 18 inch Staffords who are winning groups, but they're proportional, they're nice, they're structurally, you know, sound. So that is more important than follow, you know, than this, because we don't wick it. Our do this breed does not get checked in the ring as far as height restrictions. Since you've imported, you might have a little insight on this. What are what are the differences is in kind of say your FCI dog and your AKC dog? What is winning in the ring overseas compared to what's winning in, in the United States? You kind of touched upon the United States, but what's, what's the difference overseas? Um, so we actually get for our many of, some of our specialties, but our nationals, we have foreign judges come over, which is a great opportunity to get, you know, our dogs under them. Um, but I have found that um, dogs overseas don't seem to be as beefy um, and bully as the dogs over here. They they do tend to be leggier. Um, uh, they, they, I don't want to say terrier because most of them have pretty nice heads. Um, when I, and when I say terrier head, I'm talking about very slim muzzles. Um, you know, not, we have our standard calls for, you know, sufficient cheeks. Um, but in a very terrier staff, we have some staffers that just have that very kind of wedged terrier head. Um, but as far as like the, the body, the body goes, um, they just they don't have the the substance that we have here and I honestly I don't even know if that's beneficial or not because there's some people that say um you know how if you consider what these dogs were meant to do how can a dog who is you know short and has all this bone and substance how are they gonna how would they survive in a ring how would they move around and be able to to fight in the ring and then you have others who say, you know, well, uh, look at the dog that has all legs. Their legs are going to snap. You know, I, I've heard both sides of this, and it, it has, it's just like, where do I go? I, I need a middle ground here because, you know, I don't know what is right. Because if you look at, if you look at the dogs, the Staffords from, like the 70s they were very they were pretty substantial and leggy <laughs> and they didn't have they didn't have like we had I call it like the heads that we have on our staffers these days they're they're so very modern their 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 muzzles are real full they're kind of um they're kind of short and we have a lot of top school um but if you look at dogs uh even from early on um, in development, even up to like like around the 70s, we didn't have a lot of top school at all. It was it was kind of similar to like the similar to ABDA style um, American pit bull terriers. It's just not a whole lot of stop, not a whole lot of top school. It's kind of very flat. Um, and I, I couldn't even tell you which one was more correct because 
you can say, oh, well, the original dogs had this type head, but look at the dogs that are winning today. And it's, it, it still fits. It still fits the standard, though. Um, so that, that's kind of the struggle there. But I do find the dogs overseas, they, ha- they tend to have the nice modern heads, but their bodies kind of tend to be more, more terrier-y. Some of the, uh, wh- what does health testing mean to your program? Um, health, yeah. Uh, it's fair, I would say, oh, it's kind of cut and dry, really, um, here. Uh, I was watching, um, I was watching one of the, your podcasts with the American Bullies and, and how it, that's been kind of a struggle. I, I guess the breeders coming up and kind of wanting to learn how to health test and, and, um, luckily, um, our, you know, like our parent club, um, you know, you can go to our parent site and it'll, it'll list everything that you need, you know, um, and, and it, I don't, it's pretty extensive. You know, you have your typical OFA hips and elbows. I like to do pin hip. I do like the measurements. Um, we're, I think we're getting to a point where people want to, um, push doing both OFA hips and pin hip because not only so it's like it's kind of like you have your measurements here so you're looking at you're looking at the laxity and the looseness and then you have your you know your OFA and uh your OFA view and they're kind of looking at how the 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 ball the ball joints fit into the socket um so you just kind of get a bigger picture um, and then patellas, of course, uh, the genetic panel. Um, we do uh, hereditary c- cataracts, um, which is all part of the the genetic panel. But we're also supposed to get the eyes checked every year, along with, um, and then we have to get the heart checked. Uh, patellas was listed as optional, but I think we have changed it now to um, required in order to get. Um, the full health testing, um, but I would say that that's pretty, pretty cut and dry. Um, I am not one that will, because um, there are some people out there that will completely eliminate a dog for having like mild hips. Um, you know, eliminate a dog from a breeding program. I, I, I have different views on that. We have a lot of controversy because, like I said, our breed community is so very protective of our breed. Um, but from what everything I have read and seen, like if you have a dog that has mild hips, but but they, I mean, their pin hip results might be, you know, average or maybe a little better than average. And, you know, they're bred to a dog that has a, a great hips. You're you can get dogs that have fantastic hips. And actually that has happened to me. Colts, my first Stafford's hips went um, mild. Um, I did have an issue with the vet. I got them redone. They came back as fair, but that's still pretty poor. Um, And this was kind of before I knew kind of, I wasn't as experienced and I didn't know what I knew now. So I had talked to some people in the community, and I was like, I guess I'm going to have to scratch him for my program, and I was devastated. I was like, I'm going ha- to I'm gonna have to – I'm going to have to start over, basically. And I had some people who were like, wait, whoa, <laughs> whoa, don't throw the baby out with the bath water. Um, and she said, to, you know, one, try again and, you know, look in the pen hip, which I did as well, and his hips came back. His – the ranges were average. So – um, a puppy that I kept from his first litter, her hips are fantastic. Um, I did pin hip on her and they are, they are well above, like they're fantastic. I think the rating was like point, 0.38 and 0. 0.40 and breed average is 0. 0.5, 0. 0.54, I believe, um, for pin hip on Staffordshire and Bull Terriers. So, um, I've kind of changed my view on how I handle those kinds of issues when it comes to health testing. For things like um, cardiac and um, eyes, they they ha- they oftentimes have clinic at shows, um, like this last weekend in 
at a job show, they, um, it was, so it was like $30 for ice to get the ice check and $40 for heart. That's two of the health testing out of the way for 70, was it 70 bucks? Yeah, 40 and 30, 70 bucks. Um, the genetic panel, you can get that um, for, at least for mine, you can get that for about 110 that that takes care of like three of the listed health testing. The big the most the biggest expense is the hips and the elbows. But even then, you can find reasonable vets. Um, I, I recently did hips and uh, elbows on the sire of these puppies, and that cost me under four hundred dollars. So um, I don't feel like the health testing should be used as a tool to cost to like charge more um i feel like how i charge like how i charge for my puppies yeah okay health test health testing is part of it but it one i charge as like basically what the market value is and, I, and that sounds terrible as i say it because people are like oh she's in it for the money but no it I am putting money into these dogs, and it's not just health testing, okay? Because I can I can find health testing for for fairly cheap. I've gotten to a point where I can I can you know pull it together fairly cheap. But I'm also still, you know you know money spent in raising dogs, money spent in um, all the things that you need that goes into it. Um, showing uh, sports and a lot and you'll, some will say, well, you know you don't have to show a dog to you know you don't have to do sports. But to me. It's like yeah, yes. In order to in order to prove that the dog is, is worth, you know, worthy of being bred, yeah, that is something I need to do. And that is not expen That is not cheap, you know. Um, it just it all adds up <laughs> um, as a whole, not just the one thing, not just you know, it's not just the health testing that 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 you can justify having high prices it's the whole picture it's it's everything um because like i think there are going to be times where you you are going to take a risk health wise there are situations where you take where you are you going to take a risk health wise when i imported um my last one from ukraine um parents were not health tested but most most breeders overseas do not do health testing so that is a risk that I'm taking, but but she, honestly, right now she is my nicest Stafford. Um, she literally, just like you said, ticked all the boxes. Um, she's spectacular, and I can you know I'm just that you know when health testing comes that you know everything will be okay. Um, they were for Colt um, overall, but there will be times where you might have to take some risk, and then. It, except that if it does fail you might be a pet it might end up being just a pet or might end up being you know um a dog that you might place if you if you don't want if you can't if you don't have the room i guess you could say because when it comes to having a program it gets to a point <clears throat> where you can only keep so many pets if you're really 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 wanting to improve your program and re and you're just like this is what you want to do. Um, there's only so many pets that you can keep. And I will tell you that in my breed and in many breeds, there are a lot of people who, a lot of people who kind of disagree with this. Um, and kind of, maybe I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but I actually think it's really, really important. Um, no, go for it. I, I appreciate it. So a lot like to keep, oh, awesome. <laughs> um, a lot like to keep their their animals for life and I, I do get that a lot think that it's cruel to um get a dog and to raise it and then place it if it doesn't belong and 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 this kind and, and this kind of goes in with it my second point it kind of goes in with it so i'm going to include it before i say my point um there's also a lot of people within my breed who disagree with breeding who disagree with breeding frequently um a lot of breeders like to um only breed you know uh, every few years i think I, I i one breeder told me they they, they have bred three times in like 20 something years um and 
I don't think there's anything wrong with that for their, if that's what they want to do in their program, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I also don't think that there's anything wrong with a breeder who has a program where they do breed frequently. And I'm not talking about pumping out puppies to make money. I, because you have to breed to have experience. You have to, you have to breed to figure out what works and what doesn't work. If you look at some of the dogs who are, you know, top winning dogs, they typically come from breeders who have bred and who have experienced breeding and who have tried, who have, who have really, who have like tried different things and to see what works for them and what doesn't work for them. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with breeding maybe a couple times a year. Um, as long as each, each breeding has a goal to improve each, each breeding has a goal in mind. Um, and then of course the health testing, you know, as a, as a tool to help and obviously backing up your puppies, you know, all, I will always take my puppies back. My pets go on spay and neuter, you know, being responsible for your puppies that you produce because you are responsible for every one. But when it comes to the number of litters you have a year, I don't think someone should be condemned for having several litters a year. Um, and I have come across that in quite a bit. Um, but yeah. Oh, so, and that kind of goes back to, so if you, if you get a puppy and it's promising, but the puppy, it, it doesn't turn out. Um, this happened to me recently. I, I, I got, a she was a, a beautiful puppy. The pedigree was great. Um, both parents championed, um, and she just she ended up she had a elongated soft palate um she just had a couple of issues and in the end she just was not a dog that i thought should be bred so i i ended up getting um the palate surgery done on her to kind of help free up her airways and i spayed her she was almost two years old or at two years old and i ended up sending her to a pet home and a lot of people think that's cruel, but I don't because she's going to sit in my, she's going to be here and she, yeah, she'll be a pet. And I, I, you know, I love my dogs, but I, I have a goal and I want to reach that goal and I can only have so many dogs to, uh, to reach that goal. Um, and I do believe that it's unfair to her because I am going to be going to shows or sports and, and, you know, she, I guess she could do sports, but I need room for my up and comers and that may be controversial to some, but I don't agree with it. I, I think that there's nothing wrong with it when you have a goal and if it's best for the, if it's best for the dog. Now, I've only been breeding, you know, for about four years, um, so I do consider myself a baby baby um, into it, but I recently got to see some in our breed go to Westminster. They actually, I mean, not Westminster, Crufts, so they actually got to go to, you know, overseas, and, and it was some one of them even brought their dog and got to show in Crufts. I thought that was incredible. Um, and, you know, inside I'm like, oh man, I wish I was at that point. And then I'm, like, then I'm like, oh, I've only been breeding for four years. Like I can't, I can't expect that like instantly. Um, you know, I got to do the work. Um, I just, one, I want to, I want to, I do try to have a goal for each, each litter. Um, and I do have like a, a couple directions that I, I want to kind of work on and see kind of what fits. Um, one of my biggest goals is to, to, um, to create my, my own, a type, my type. Cause there, there are dogs that I can look at and I know exactly what kennel that dog comes from. Um, I know that, that, you know, this, that dog is a prize sale dog. That dog, that dog is an irresistible dog. You know, like, I, and I think that's wonderful. I, I think it's, it's fantastic. Um, and that, that is what I want 
um, something that I want. I want consistency. Um, but I, you know, I'm still learning how things work. Um, I'm learning how to kind of put the puzzles together when it comes to, to phenotype and genotype, uh, pedigree and, and how they look, um, and kind of how that all fits together. Um, I just did my first line breeding. This, this litter I have now is my very, very first line breeding. I was very careful about it on who I doubled up on. Um, and I actually have found that the, the litter is quite consistent. Um, there's a little bit of differences in the heads, but the body types are very, very similar. Um, and that's kind of what I, I want across the board. Um, so I, j I do want to con continue to improve. Um, like I said, I pretty much spent this last these last four years trying to figure out what I feel is well, one, to get over this whole height and weight thing and kind of accept that I'm probably not going to be able to conform to that exactly if I'm going to do okay in the show ring. Um, I would like to campaign. I want a dog. I want a dog that I can campaign. campaign. I think that would be awesome. Um, I want to get there. I want a, bre a dog that I am um, bred by that I can campaign and go kind of as far as I can with them. Um, an obvious goal would be, you know, a Westminster invite. Uh, I know there's a lot of breeders out there who have gotten that, and, and um, that's kind of like a, a simple <laughs> um, Westminster invite, and then maybe one day Westminster. But that's, a, that's such a long, long way off. I feel it's unattainable, so I'm just going to keep trucking. <laughs> It, it, it can be a bit overwhelming. Um, I sometimes feel, and maybe it's because I'm new, I sometimes feel, I guess, what do you call, like um, imposter syndrome where you, it's like, like I don't feel like part of it. Um, you know, I I am, um, you know, I, I went through some hard times, so I have not shown as much as I want to, and I'm hoping this year that I'm going to pick it back up um, as much as I was before um, and then even more so. And luckily, I'm now in a place where I can do that. Um, and, and I do have specific goals, like more specific goals as far as what I want for um, my overall look of the dog. I, 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 um, I do have ideas with that that I want to run with. Um, but it's fairly detailed stuff that's, you know. Um, but overall goal is just kind of work my way up uh, one step at a time, one show at a time. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I like that answer. Um, talk about when you're when you're going to keep a puppy. What are some of the things that you look for uh, to be not only a good show prospect but a good uh, future breeding prospect? So when I because I have a couple litters a year, and because I do like as I mentioned about. Um, you know, there's only so many that a breeder can keep. I often utilize um, guardian homes. Um, I think they are fantastic, or some people call them show friendly. Um, I have some pretty pretty nice Staffords um, in homes that have let me, or you know, that have worked with me um, yeah, showing. I, I have, I in fact, I finished my first guardian home dogs championship uh, a couple months ago. Um, and that, that's been fantastic. Um, I kind of say, because like I said, I talked about my different directions, you know, that I'm kind of going with and seeing what works and what doesn't. There are certain litters that, you know, I have plans that I have plans for. And it's like, um, that is one that I'm, that puppy, you know, I'm keeping this puppy with me. Um, cause it's, there is always a risk using, there's always a risk bringing someone else in. You know, but um, keeping a puppy is kind of like the safest guarantee that you, you <laughs> what you want is going to happen. So um, I I do get a lot of help uh, from my AMP staff breeder. Um, she, I guess you could say she's my mentor. Every litter she helps, she does help me evaluate. Um, but I start stacking my puppies uh, at four weeks. 
um, and then I do weekly evaluations um, basically until they are like nine weeks around seven to eight weeks is kind of like the most important time and then you know what in between that you kind of have you kind of just have to watch the dogs and how they move naturally how they interact naturally like naturally because you can have a dog that is gorgeous but the temperament is just not there it's very first off the breed is very soft so trying to build a very soft stafford uh, softer than usual stafford up can be very difficult so um sometimes having a dog that has that charisma um and you just kind of you just kind of know when you see them you know just kind of strutting around and you just confidence is there head is up and you you just know um but around seven to eight weeks you know i stack them up i take videos and pictures and kind of evaluate them and then i send them off to my mentor and a couple different people to try to get a collective idea of you know the the good and the bad about each puppy um and go from you know kind of go from there so um temperament structure temperament so important so important when it comes to that though yeah that's very cool that you do that that's kind of the idea that i just as a layman would would probably want to rely on is several eyes on what i'm looking at to see if i'm right or if i'm wrong that's that's smart yes, ex especially and honestly i feel like i'm always going to do that because yeah okay you know with more experience I, i'm sure i'll get to a point where i just know that i know that i know but i feel like a way a good way to prevent um i guess what they call kennel bl kennel blindness i think a good way to prevent kennel blindness would probably be to get you know, idea to get others' ideas and opinions, um, and to see if they see something that you don't see. Yeah, I 100% agree. I think, yeah, I mean, that's what being a part of the community should be is being able to help each other, like make the best uh, best decisions. Um. There are a couple of breeders in uh, California. Uh, there's like a kind of small group. They have um, puppy evaluation parties. Um, they bring their litters together and they all evaluate each other's litters. And I think that's fantastic. I wish I lived in California at that time. <laughs> um, we don't have any breeders down here to, to really do that, but I think that's wonderful. And I think that that would be great to become a normal thing across the board you know the biggest challenge was was finding finding the type and kind of where I wanted to go that that I would say absolutely that is the biggest issue I had and it took it took years to get through that um and kind of find where I finally have settled on where I want to go and then it also took accepting the fact it also took accepting that I was going to go in to another direction as well to see if that works for me because I feel like if I had just gone one way I would always wonder if about the uh, about going the other way um and I, I guess it's kind of hard to I I explain it um, but I have my dogs that I have now, um, basically from my first boy, um, to his daughter and, and now I now have a daughter from her. So basically the line that I've kind of established now, and then the import that I have from Ukraine, she's a kind of a totally different type, totally different line. That's kind of what I'm going to go for like i'm also gonna go forward with her kind of in a different way and then maybe in the future see if they can kind of intertwine in some way but right now i'm not really worried about that i'm just gonna um just go forward but uh other things that i have issues with is um well 
one, I'm still, I'm still learning structure. I, I, I mean, I think I got it. I, I'm pretty sure I got it down, but there are certain things that are difficult for me, like, um, movement, uh, movement for me. Um, like I still have to video movement and I have to slow it down and watch it in slow motion. Um, I know that uh, movement is so important because it goes hand in hand with structure. And so I'm really, really trying to learn that. I would really like to be able to look at a dog in, in real time move and be like, oh, wow, that's, you know, that's beautiful. And, I, and I'm getting there. All that takes is just time. It just takes time. Um, but I'm working really hard on that. And then, you know, not just like the side movement, you know, their extension, their, um, or their reach and extension, but they're down and back. Um, you know, Stafford's, they don't, they're not really supposed to converge. Their legs are supposed to move parallel, both front and back. And honestly, it's kind of hard to find that movement, that kind of movement in Stafford's. So that's been a struggle for me. Um, and I'm just kind of trying to see how that fits in with, you know, if I have a puppy with nice structure, but it converges in the rear a little bit, you know, am I just, I got to be willing to kind of see what I'm going to sacrifice here when it comes to moving forward. Um, there are other issues like um, I, I like the color blue uh, in Stafford's, but there is kind of a big bias um, towards blues right now. You don't really see them in the ring. Most, a lot of breeders don't want to deal with it. A lot of breeders look down on it. Um, there's even a contradiction in our standard about it. Blues are completely acceptable in our breed standard, in our breed, but it also states that they have to have a black nose. Um, well, blue staff, blue staffords cannot have a black nose. It's genetically impossible. So, you know, that, 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 it seems so minor, but it can really, really throw things off. Um, and then there's by there's kind of some myths surrounding health issues. Some are true, some aren't. So like I said, a lot of breeders don't want to deal with it. And I have been told many times that I should watch out what I show, including a blue dog. If I try to show a blue Stafford, I'm probably going to get flack. I'm probably going to get, um, I'm probably going to get a lot of talk about it, and not in a good way. And so. I actually had my first litter with Blue um, a, a little while ago, and I have one that will be kind of up and coming in the ring, and I'm a little nervous. I'm a little excited, but I'm nervous about it. Um, you know, it's kind of like I don't want to ruin my reputation, but I also feel like I'm not really doing anything that is wrong. Um you know, because it's an acceptable color. Um, I think a lot of people's concern might be that I'm trying to be a color breeder. And when the fact is, I, I'm, I'm absolutely not. I just, I enjoy that color. And I feel like a nice blue should be able to be shown in champion. And there are some breeders out there that have had blues and have championed them, but it's just so very rare. It just doesn't happen often. So I kind of just want to make it more of a normal thing. Um, just kind of more, more normalized, more normalized, basically. Um, and another, uh, probably the last struggle, I guess, would be learning lines and pedigree. <laughs> and I'm sure that's with everybody, but that's just, uh, it's a lot of information. It's a lot to learn, and you just really have to be, your whole heart and soul has to be into it to just learn it all. <laughs> um, but I think it's important to utilize history to kind of work towards the future. So if there's something that you could change about the, uh, the show world, what would it be? I wish that, um, I'm not even going to go into the politics some people, some have denied that there are politics, but there are definitely politics involved. Um, 
I feel like the actual show world is the the system we have set up. I think it's fantastic. I think I think it's a great system, but it kind of just as we we as humans just tend to mess up things. We come up with great ideas and we just we just kind of like money gets involved and we we just mess up things. But that's kind of that is is what it is. But I do wish that um people were more open to newcomers. I wish people were a little more uh friendly overall. Um it is a competition. I get that. Um but in the end, we all have the same goal. Um, and when it comes to new people, I mean, we need people who love the breed. We need people in here trying to do better by the breed. Um, and so I just think that being a little more welcoming would, it, you know, it just would make all the difference in the world. Um I find it frustrating when there, I mean, obviously losing isn't fun, but everybody loses. Um, everybody loses and everybody has their day. Um, and I, I feel like accepting your losses and celebrating your wins is, you know, I, I think that just all just comes with it. Um, I've seen, it's different being in the show world than when you were, than like before, when you're on the outside looking in, you know, in my head, it was always like, you know, I can only breed if I champion a dog and, you know, um, you know, people who, everybody who shows is ethical and, and it's kind of, you know, stuff like, it's kind of not really how it is. Not everybody who shows is ethical and honestly, not every dog who champions, you know, or who doesn't champion shouldn't be bred either. Sometimes there's, there's good dogs that just don't do well in the ring, but have to like really, they have, I've been told that some of the best dogs have never stepped, stepped foot in the ring. Um, I've been told that by a couple different people with a lot of experience and I, I can see that and I could now I can see that and understand and kind of understand it. Um, I also wish that breeders, I wish that we could all like get together, like sit, ringside and be able, able to discuss our dog's faults and not get offended with it, about it. Um, I think that it, that would be so beneficial. Um, you know, I think that would be beneficial as a whole to be able to discuss your faults and um with other people and kind of like I learned from it you know um I really could have used that when I was trying to learn structure um because I was just trying to like look at every dog and and look at okay okay what is the good and what is the bad but I could not go up to that owner and be like hey could you tell me what the you know what you like about your dog and what you don't like about your dog could you tell me what you you could improve on your dog that does not fly. You can't do that. And I feel like we should be able to without getting offended. Yeah, no, it, I agree with you. It, but I also, I also know myself. So that would be something that I would have to be really conscious of not to let my emotions get in the way, especially if I didn't like that other person that was uh, critiquing my dogs. <laughs> Um, I was to say the thing is, is that in AKC we don't get the judges don't really tell you why they didn't put up your dog, um, so you're not really getting any feedback. You can ask them, but a lot of times they're so busy that by the time you get back to them, they may not even remember, you know. And I feel like because of that, we should be able to talk to others. And, and like, okay, yeah, it can kind of be hurt, hurtful to hear the, the negatives about your dog, but it also helps how you approach, you know, how, like if a person's coming at you and being like, oh, your dog's rear is really bad. No, no, no. 
I, that's just the wrong. There's a, there's a right and a wrong way to approach it. You know, that you, you, you can have some tact talking about, you know, your dog's fault. And I'm not saying like you should go up to somebody and be like, Hey, your dog is whatever. I feel like people should come up to, you know, can, should come up to each other and they have their dogs and be, and you can be like, this is what I think, you know, this is what I like about my dog, but I wish, I, I wish she had a better top line. I wish she had better ears. You know, I feel like her rear could improve, um, you know, and, and then be able to talk, like y'all should both be able to discuss dogs without anybody being, getting offended because everybody's goal is to fix, is to fix the, no dog is perfect. And the goal is to fix those flaws. And who knows, being able to talk about it might, you know, might be beneficial. That person might be like, oh, you know, I know, you know, my friend has this male that has a fantastic top line and, and good, re everything that you are wanting, you know, would you like to get, you know, I could, maybe I can help you. It just, I feel like that would just be beneficial as a whole.